also, you know, once you tell that story, okay. then. From the top. Okay. Greetings. My name is Gerald and I work with Liberated Lens. We show films at the Omni regularly. And right now we want to talk about one of those films. I'm fortunate enough to have in the studio with me Brother Bob Mandel and Bob Wells, both who are members of the Labor Action Committee to Free Mumia. All right, just starting off, the film that we're going to show this Sunday, that is April 22nd, is entitled Mumia, Long Distance Revolutionary. Mumia Abul Jamal, Long Distance Revolutionary. Would one of you gentlemen tell us a little bit about Mumia and what, it, what the film is going to be about. Give us you know, a little taste. Well, the film is about his life story up at the present, and it's also about the, uh, <clears throat> the frame up in court by Philadelphia law enforcement. But when Mumia was a 15-year-old high school student in Philadelphia, uh, <clears throat> he joined the Black Panther Party. As a result, he was beaten by the police tracked for life by the FBI. <clears throat> and when he left the Panthers, he became a, a radio newsman for Black FM Radio in Philadelphia, making a uh, career out of exposing on radio the corruption and brutality of the Philadelphia police, which is pretty extreme even in terms of the rest of the country. Uh, to the point where the police and law enforcement in Philadelphia decided to get rid of him. Uh, he was warned personally at a press conference by the mayor of Philadelphia, Frank Rizzo, who was the former police chief, whose style of going to the opera was to put a nightclub in his, in his uh, belt. In his tuxedo belt? In his tuxedo belt, okay, yeah. Okay, he country fool, all right. And uh, there's a bronze statue of him in Philadelphia saying hello, which is to say Heil. <laughs> no, it's, it's a Nazi salute. Mm, mm, mm. So in 1981, he was framed for the murder of a policeman, uh, <clears throat> sentenced in a kangaroo trial over the Fourth of July weekend to life imprisonment. And in 2001, I think, he was on death row from 1982 to 2001. Finally, the life, the uh, death sentence was commuted to life without parole. So the movie, Mumia Abu Jamal, Long Distance Revolutionary, tells that story, mm -hmm. how he grew up in the projects in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. how he, since he's been in prison, he's written eight books about uh, law, uh, jailhouse lawyer, about black religion, about the history of the Black Panther Party, about politics. Uh, he's got himself a master's degree and he's going for a PhD at uh, Cal State Fullerton. And the movie uh, lays out his life story, which is very uh, inspiring. What's mainly inspiring is his courage, because he's never, never yielded, never bent but to these tremendous pressures that have been put on him. Hmm, hmm. And the movie spells that out very clearly. Okay, well, let me ask you about, you know, you, okay? Um, in terms of your activity, what would you care to share with us about your work to support Mumia? Because actually, you had uh, pointed out to me that you had assisted Mumia to acquire a subscription to the to a newspaper is that right i did yes uh, <clears throat> for one thing for somebody who's been locked up in solitary for 32 years he has an amazing grasp of what's going on in the world mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I, saw, I guess a lot of that depends on his subscription to usa today mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Well, let me turn to Bob here a minute. <clears throat> well, from Bob to Bob. Let me, let me say, uh, what would you care to share with us about your experience in supporting Mumia Abu Jamal? I, I think that as teachers, you guys actually organize a district wide movement to educate the people of Oakland and beyond. Uh, who Mumia Abu, you know, who he was, who Mumia was, and also about the death penalty. Is that correct? Yes. We did that in 1999, and it was enormously controversial. And the reason it's enormously controversial can actually be answered by looking at what's going on in Sacramento mm -hmm. right now. Um, the recent murder of Stefan Clark by the Sacramento police, or if you go back to Louisiana, the decision to not file charges against the cops in the Elton Sterling um, murder by police. And we know this goes on literally every 28 hours in the United States. And to take that up in the classroom in an urban setting um, set a frenzy among the powers that be, both the police and the media, um, because the last thing they want is an honest discussion about the role of police in American society, which is not to protect and serve, it's to repress and control. Just along that lines, I remember doing a little research on this matter, and I remember reading an article, and I cannot remember the name of the gentleman involved, but there was actually the shooting of a police officer in Oakland around the time that we, I think it was in December, before you, you know, before the event that you're, yeah. you're talking about. And oh man, they they so opportunistic. They jumped on that and said, "Oh, we can't have a cop killer uh, worshipped right. in our schools when you have here a murder of our police." How do we respond to this foolishness? Well, they had brought that up from the beginning, and we said that the one had absolutely nothing to do with the other, mm -hmm. and that um, Maria Mumia is not a cop killer. For me, it's innocent. Mm -hmm. Another person um, commit, confessed to the crime. You know, I'm, I'm wondering what is it that does not allow these reactionary pundits or would-be pundits to put one and one together? Because, <laughs> well, if you, if Mumia Abdul Jamal has always spoken up for, uh, asserted his innocence, is that not the case? Yes. Yeah, all right. So he says, I'm innocent. So he never accepted the moniker of cop killer, ever. And if one familiarizes oneself with the facts surrounding the case, it becomes pretty clear. How do you convict an innocent person like that if he was innocent? How does that happen? How do you wind up? being convicted if you were innocent in the first place? I'm asking a question. <clears throat> well, one thing they did was um, any witnesses, there were witnesses uh, who were favorable to Mamiya were mm -hmm. either intimidated to changing their testimony. In one case, a man was a Vietnam veteran and a business owner, and he wouldn't change his testimony. Mm -hmm. He was a, a black uh, tow truck driver, tow truck business owner. Mm -hmm. The uh, police terrorized him. But it, I mean, Philadelphia's <laughs> police terror is what runs Philadelphia. So they brought the, the police pressure on him, and he went back south. He's, I, he might still be living in the south. Left the city. Left the city because he didn't want to change his testimony. Right. This is America, sir. It is. It's exactly you, right. Are, it are, you, are you saying that this type of behavior is permitted in this great land? Are you kidding? 
No, I'm not. <laughs> so, that, that's, that's sad, isn't it? Yeah. You know, I'd like to say something about <clears throat> why Mumi was targeted, why there are still several dozen, I think, uh, Panthers still in jail. Um, before the Panthers were founded in Oakland, Oakland had the highest ratio of police executions of arrested suspects of any city in the United States, wow. which is saying something given Chicago's record and Philly's record mm -hmm. and so on. And the Panther patrols of the police with guns in one hand and law book in the other actually put an end to that for over 20 years. Mm. And if you think about that on a national scale, why did J. Edgar Hoover um, target them with COINTELPRO? He targeted King because he was afraid of um, a black messiah. And he targeted the Panthers because the Panthers were putting into practice programs which directly challenged both police terror and the fundamental inadequacies of the system. Mm. And I know that um, when we f first decided to organize the teaching, part of it was because we know what, whatever the Panthers' mistakes, that's not why they were attacked by the capitalist government. And we thought it was important for kids growing up in Oakland to know the legacy of the free breakfast program, sickle cell testing, uh, patrolling the police, and so on. Mm -hmm. And thereby, it was useful to, for them to understand Mumia exactly. and his roots. Exactly. Wonderful. Now, just more recently, well, no, let's go back now. So we have this event, because I was, active at the time, and I remember that it was unusual to have, well, I'm saying to have the entire district talking about the injustice of the death penalty, the racist nature of the death penalty, and talking about a political prisoner in a country where they deny that they are political prisoners. In fact, I was given a box of essays to look over that had been written by children, because I've always been active in the schools. I've run for school board in the past. And to be honest, I was shocked. Shocked. Whatever you did, you touched these children in some way, because they were writing about these subjects, death penalty, mumia, uh, their family members in jail, et cetera. So if nothing else but just these expressions from these children came out of this event, I can see that it looked like it was pretty worthwhile. What was your evaluation of the event after you successfully executed the event? The teaching? Mm -hmm. Well, it wasn't just our assessment. It was teachers generally who took part in it. It took part at every level from <clears throat> High school to kindergarten. Okay. Uh, high school teachers were saying that um, <clears throat> students that they hadn't seen in class for weeks were showing up. That the, you know they had to wow. had to scramble to find seats. That the kids were paying attention, who were usually goofing off or not there, and uh, were writing and talking about stuff. Maybe not too literally. Liter. Literate. Not, lit, yeah, yeah, not, I, I with not too much. And that was the teachers, the mm -hmm. education's fault. But they were taking seriously these questions of constitutional law, policing, uh, the issues uh, that affect them, which they didn't hear much of in school as a rule. And all the way down to kindergarten, they say, oh, well, what can you do in kindergarten? But if you've ever been around kids who are four, five, and six, they have a very sharp sense of right and wrong, fair and unfair, justice, very sharp. And they grasped immediately what the teachers were talking about <clears throat> at their level. They could see the unfairness, and uh, they were 
you know, doing drawings, writing. I uh, saw some of that. Yeah, and from kindergarten through high school. Magnificent, <clears throat> what I saw. Oh, okay, let's and slip so over. Let's jump, uh, so now let's jump forward that exactly because the teaching struck a nerve and because the teaching made international news and along with um, the Longshore work stoppage, which happened about three months later, the longshoremen on the West Coast shut down every port on the West Coast, demanding that Mumia be set free. Mm -hmm. You jump forward to 2014, and the police, who have a very long memory, um, and the state, which they represent, the government, which they enforce for, has a long memory. Um, the Oakland School District had a website that had a teacher developed curriculum. And one of the lessons on the website was asking high school students to compare Mumia's uh, prison writings with Martin Luther King's later writings, his radical writings after the speech on Vietnam and so on. And the, through Fox News, the police intervened and the, uh, demanded of the school district that this website be taken down. Now, wait a minute, through Fox News? What? <laughs> I don't be watching no Fox News. What's up with that? You telling me that somebody, sure. Come on, saw, <laughs> somebody saw the website and, and read about it and said, oh my goodness, and then went and informed to Fox News that they need to start a campaign yep. of some sort, yep. which they then initiated. Yep. And then what was the result? Well, the school district immediately took down the website. Notice, wait a minute, they didn't discuss this at they all immediately, with the initiators of the website? They immediately. And what this represented and represents, it was a really important fight. This was basically the police determining what could be taught in the classroom. Oh, they were literally saying they that it goes. Don't, wait, don't the administrators already know that cops are not educators? I'm not trying to be funny here. Now let's, this seemed like they added a tree and it would seem like a self-respecting administrator could not possibly take serious anything that a cop has to say about a curriculum for children, particularly black children, you know, in terms of Dr. Kim or Mumi Abu-Jamal or any, well, anything else as far as I'm concerned. So what was the result of this? Because we do have to move this along. Let's go. Well, you put your finger on it, a self-respecting administrator. <laughs> there were none. Okay. Okay. There were none, and this is the period of a massive attack on public education in the U.S. and in Oakland in specific. The development of more chartered schools, again proportion, proportional to the size of the school district than anywhere else in the U.S. So they, it's not just, they weren't self-respecting. They know, knew who was paying their way and the response was absolutely down it comes. But that was not the end of the story, was it? No. Well then let me hear what so what happened? So they got their way, they shut down the site, so what's what's up? Well uh, group, take it in the chin and grin. A small group called the Oakland Teachers for Mumia, which had uh, people who had organized the nineteen ninety nine teach in as Bob said, that, that was completely unacceptable. Couldn't, couldn't be allowed to stand. And so uh, <clears throat> we and others, some Oakland teachers from Mumia, were attending every school board meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> stories were appearing in the press. Notable people, uh, Alice Waters. Okay. No, Alice Walker. Yes, Alice Walker. Alice Walker. Uh, Ed Asner, mm -hmm. who is a big supporter of Mumia, both of them are, wrote letters. And finally, the uh, 
after a summer of pressure on the school board, they reinstated the... Uh, well, if my memory serves me, it also intersected the Raheem Brown killing. Oh, yeah, that's true. So the Oakland police, the Oakland school district police murdered a young man, a 19-year-old, um, who was parked outside a school dance at Skyline High I'm School. I'm well aware of that, yes. And um, what we were able to do was catch them in the contradiction of their cops killing somebody who had been a student in the district and um, them, re them caving into the police on the question of you can't discuss Mumia and in context with Dr. King. So we won. Yeah, okay, and the site is up today. Yes. And if someone wants to go to the site, how could they do so? Google, Google urban dreams, urban as in city, urban dreams, and you'll find it. Okay. <laughs> Say that one more time. I'm sorry, I was distracted. That's quite, I, it's on TV. Google urban dreams, urban as in city. Urban Dreams Annual Fund. So, we're going to show this film about Mumia Abul Jamal. In it, they're going to go over his biography, how he lives, the the con the uh, the uh, commentaries he makes, and all of that. And then you guys, are you guys coming to the film? Will you be able to be present and explain, answer questions, you know, that people may have about the film? Absolutely. Oh, very good. So is there anything else that we want uh, people to know in terms of struggling for justice for this innocent man? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's to me. <laughs> well, here, I got it. Right. Or it's more legible. <laughs> <laughs> These are not as new as they used to be. So uh, <clears throat> on Saturday, April 28th at noon, uh, there's a rally at Franco Gower Plaza in downtown Oakland, mm -hmm. otherwise better known as Oscar Grant Plaza, mm -hmm. uh, in support of Mumia's court case. And then there's going to be a march from there to the uh, Oakland police headquarters. Okay. And this is going to be taking place in a number of other cities around the country, also, especially in Philadelphia. And hopefully the pressure will uh, <clears throat> encourage the system to do the right thing about Mumia. He ha he's in court. He's a very interesting court case. Um, well, wait a minute. Let me, let me get this straight so people need to know. Okay. Mumia was convicted of murder. Yes. You allege that Mumia is innocent. Yes. I have researched that on my own, and I would tend to agree with you. That's the facts point to his innocence. Now, it's over. He's, he's, they done locked him up. You said they took him off a death row, so w what are you talking about here? Well, if he's innocent, he should be out, right? You're innocent, you're not in prison. Absolutely, but he's already been convicted. I'm innocent. So, so how is it that he's in court? Well, because... Uh, there was a Supreme Court decision about 18 months ago involving a Pennsylvania case that said that somebody who was involved as a prosecutor in a case cannot then sit as a judge oh, yeah. on oh, yeah. I, appeals I involving the case. You're talking case. about the, let me get this right, the Williams versus State of Pennsylvania. Right. Decision mm -hmm. of the Supreme Court. Okay. And so the, now, ju okay. the judge is named Ronald Castile. He was the judge in the case that the Supreme Court found to be unconstitutional. And he was a judge um, also in Mumia's appeals. And he was um, assistant DA and then lead um, during. Uh, periods of Mumia's appeal. Oh, that's some that's some some stuff like from To Kill a Mockingbird yep. or something. Mm -hmm. Yep. I mean, this is he's the, the judge, the prosecutor, everything. Exactly. And this guy actually wrote the governor 
of uh, Pennsylvania urging essentially mass killing. He urged him to expedite the execution of everyone on death row. So that's the kind of judge and prosecutor that we're hoping to get the conviction overturned. It would just seem logical that one cannot be <laughs> the prosecutor and the post-conviction relief appellate judge that's a contradiction a little bit too much for me to swallow. Yeah, he's ruling on his own rulings. Exactly. All right, so that's not cool. That's why you're protesting, is that right? Yes. So what we have is movie Sunday. Mm -hmm. Let me see, six o'clock they say the door is open and the Omni is located 4799 Shattuck Avenue in Oakland and the film starts, doors open at six, film starts at seven, and these two gentlemen, Bob Mandel and Bob Wells, will be with Liberated Lens that night to answer questions from the audience. Gentlemen, I wanna thank you very much for joining me. Thank you, and we hope everyone comes to the rally as well. Thanks for the opportunity. So now we assign.